Coming up on At the Heart of It with Nancy Brown. In the age of misinformation, there's not enough people being confident to say, I don't know. In the age of medicine meeting capitalism, there's not enough people feeling confident enough to say, I don't know. The smartest people in the room usually are the ones who are the most confident to say they don't know. Welcome to At the Heart of It. I'm Nancy Brown, CEO of the American Heart Association. With over 1 billion views on social media, the internet phenomenon has created one of the largest health education platforms in the world and shows no sign of stopping. He is on a mission to combat misinformation online and his devoted followers can't get enough. It's a testament to our global demand for honest, transparent healthcare advice from credible, trustworthy sources. As one of the most followed doctors on social media, Dr. Mike contributes regularly to noteworthy publications and presents lectures to prominent forums. Do not write off health professionals who say I don't know. Because much of his work is in the public eye, it's only fitting that he also serves as ambassador for the United Nations Verified Initiative, a pursuit aimed at delivering trusted information, life-saving advice, and stories from the best of humanity. Before he was known as Dr. Mike, Mikhail Varshavsky immigrated with his family from Saransk, Russia to Brooklyn, New York, when he was only six years old. His math professor mother could only find work sweeping floors, while his physician father attended medical school for the second time in a different language. Under their tutelage, Mikhail quickly learned English and thrived in school. Known on the internet as Dr. Mike, the influencer launched his platform during med school and became a go-to resource for millions of people seeking advice during the pandemic. Now he uses his influential platform to combat false and misleading health information and promote critical thinking, media literacy, and fact-checking, and all with a healthy dose of humor. Dr. Mike, I am so excited to have you uh, on my show today. Thank you so much for being here. But before we start, I want to ask you a couple questions. I have this fun game called Signature Five. Are you ready? Okay, what's on your playlist at the gym? I like a little house music with high BPMs, probably even a little faster than what we recommend for chest compressions. Oh my goodness. All right, do you have a handyman on speed dial or are you a Mr. Fix-It? Oh no, I love fixing everything. Everyone calls me in the family. They want to set up a TV. They want to get a new phone. They always call me. I know who to call now. I can't get anyone to help me. Uh, what's your favorite Instagram filter? Instagram filter? Um, I try and go no filter. Try and keep it as honest as possible. Good for you. Yeah. Authenticity, which is your hallmark. So I yeah, love exactly. that. Action movie or rom-com? I'm going to say it depends, but I think rom-com. I grew up on them. Did you? Yeah. All right. How about dog park or Central Park? Dog park. You have a dog? Yes, Tell I have a I have a big Newfoundland uh, that's not too far away actually right now. He's 140 pounds, big floofy boy. I bet he doesn't sleep in bed with you. No, right? yes, that's too hot. Yeah, it's too hot. <laughs> right by your feet though. Yeah, exactly. That's good. They're very protective. Yeah. How incredible. Well, you know, your whole life is actually incredible. You have more than 10 million subscribers on YouTube. How phenomenal. You of course, take great responsibility in how you talk about healthcare. Why do you think so many people tune in, especially now that the pandemic is over? Well, I started my YouTube channel before the pandemic in hopes of fighting this misinformation tidal wave that I felt was coming. In 2017, I even wrote an op-ed for the American Academy of Family Physicians, where I said the absence of evidence-based quality medical professionals online is gonna create room for misinformation, bad actors, snake oil salesmen. And what happened? Three years later, we had the pandemic. Misinformation became its own pandemic. And people really started tuning in, even though already we had millions of followers on YouTube, but now there was a, a time component, component to it where they needed to tune in. So I think that's a, a big reason as to why the success has been there. 
you're likely getting questions about the latest healthcare, fad, diet, before even people ask their own doctors. What do you hear from people? Like, what are some of the kinds of inaccurate claims that you get, and how do you help turn that around? Well, what I'm lucky uh, in that, in my field, that I'm able to see patients as a family medicine doctor, and a lot of the ideas that come from my YouTube channel come from what I hear in, the, in my practice. So I hear the types of misinformation they hear, and then I'm able to address it. The big pattern that I see happening over the last few years is miracle shortcuts. Oh, yeah. Which are trying to replace good old fashioned hard work when it comes to taking care of your health. You know, when a patient comes to see me and I don't want to make them jump to take a medication when we can make some lifestyle changes, those lifestyle changes take work. Yes. It takes work to follow a proper healthy diet. It takes work to get eight hours of sleep. It's hard to get 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. But when a miracle snake oil salesman comes in and says, you don't have to do that. I have the shortcut pill for you right here or potion right here. That's what I have to fight back against. And it's actually really hard. And I'll tell you why. When I, as an evidence-based physician, make a recommendation on a medical treatment, it comes from evidence. So I have proof that this works better than placebo in randomized controlled studies. When someone comes in and makes a miracle claim, they don't have that evidence. So as an evidence-based physician, I can say to the general public, there's no evidence to say that that miracle potion works. You're absolutely right. We say at the American Heart Association, of course, you know, that there are eight essential things you have to do to protect, preserve, and enhance your cardiovascular health, yes. exercise, food being at the top of it, and sleep is so important. And you know, the guidance is so simple of what you need to do. And the thing that's frustrated me over so many years are a lot of the fad diets. You know, people who think, oh, if I just, you know, eat cabbage soup for, you know, six months, I'm going to, you know, weigh 120 pounds. And it just doesn't work that way. I think what the bad actors and misinformation uh, individuals that spread misinformation have done is they've really attacked at the heart health literacy of the yes. general public. Because what I try and do on my channel is not necessarily to debunk every single claim that's out there, but instead instill the understanding of how medicine works and what understanding we actually do have. So if I can explain to a patient why I recommend uh, following a Mediterranean diet for heart health, why I recommend eight hours of sleep, mm -hmm. then they're more likely to understand and actually be on board to follow the advice. Yeah. So uh, I'm hoping that we can create this team collaborative approach that will yield better health outcomes. Yeah, and I think the way you inspire people to take control of their health is so mm -hmm. great. Now, tell me about how you fact check. I know that you have many opportunities, just as we do with the AHA, to react to misleading information, to false health claims. But how do you do your fact checking? Yeah, so I'm not really a researcher at heart. I'm not an expert on all the things that I talk about. But what I am and what I've become an expert in is communication and especially understanding general medicine, which is my specialty in family medicine. So what I do is I look for people that have conducted their research, that are experts in their field. I look to ma major organizations like the AHA, the CDC, the FDA. I look at their recommendations. I look at the reasoning behind their recommendations, and then I'm able to translate that as a, a prominent communicator online to the general public. So a lot of the information, even throughout the pandemic, wasn't my personal opinion. It was my explanation and reasoning for what the FDA or CDC was recommending at the time. Yeah, that's really great. And you know, I know that staying ahead of misinformation when things are happening rapidly can sure. be really challenging. How do you do that? Well, I think it's really important to do that because when you have a gray zone, an area where modern science doesn't have a good answer, or yet they haven't publicized their uh, level of understanding of a given subject, that's where misinformation tends yes. to thrive. So we try and find those gray areas and plug those holes by explaining what it is that we don't know yet and where further research is guiding us so that we can get people excited about further research. We can get them involved in clinical trials perhaps or making donations to organizations that are doing the research to help figure out that gray zone. Let me ask you a question. When you were in medical school and in college, did you envision yourself as a communicator? What was the, the day you launched your channel? What was on your mind? Well, I'll, the short 
version of this is I remember studying for my medical boards and I was studying alongside my friend who was studying for his nursing boards. And this was at the time where Instagram was a very new app. And he started taking pictures outside the library window of the sky. And I asked him what he was doing. And he said, well, there's a new app, it's called Instagram, that if you take a picture of the sky and you do hashtag sunset, you'll get a lot of likes. <laughs> I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. I thought he was just trying to not study. And I said, well, what if we do this in a medical way? Is there a way to add this into my daily life as a med student, encourage medical uh, interested college students to go into med school? And I started doing that. Then I had a little bit of popularity in traditional media. Once that ended, I had to figure out a way to continue spreading my meaningful message. And that was through YouTube. And I wanted to fight back against all that misinformation that I see in my patients as a resident. Uh, I wanted to fight and cre create that health literacy across the board. So it's not just being served to one demographic, but make it available for free to all. That's like the beauty of YouTube. It's available to everyone and anyone. And it's high quality information with the best guests. Um, and that's uh, been the goal from day one. Yeah, I, I am trying to envision your life because you have this really busy practice with patients. Mm -hmm. You're doing all of this work on your channel, but you're also doing a lot of videos and other kinds of public appearances. Mm -hmm. How does it all fit together? How do you make it all work? Honestly, it feels when I describe it like it's a recipe for burnout. <laughs> but for some reason, because I'm involved in so many different aspects here, it kind of refreshes you each time you jump into a new task. And because no one's forcing me to do this, I'm doing this because I love it, that alone recharges me, makes me excited to continue on with the next, next task. So whether I'm walking my dog, I'm seeing a patient in the office, doing videos, doing a college speaking appearance, I'm excited to be there. And I think when that passion's there, it really makes the process go by so much smoother. I love it. So your whole life is integrated and I bet you still get eight hours of sleep. Oh yeah, that's a must. Yeah. If I don't get eight hours, I'm a disaster. Yeah, I, I'm pretty grumpy myself if that doesn't happen. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned all these things you do, all the places you are. And one of the other places you've had a great visibility is with your TED Talk mm -hmm. on I Don't Know. Yes. Tell us about I Don't Know and why those words really matter. In the age of misinformation, there's not enough people being confident to say, I don't know. In the age of medicine meeting capitalism, there's not enough people feeling confident enough to say, I don't know. And I actually went to this TED conference in Monaco and I had to create a speech. And the speech needed to center around the theme of the conference. And the theme of the conference was the license to know. It was like a spin on James Bond. Yeah. And I said, okay, well, I'm gonna do a speech on saying I don't know, <laughs> the exact opposite of what their conference was about. And it really highlighted the fact that the smartest people in the room usually are the ones who are the most confident to say they don't know. They're the ones who ask the best questions to find out the answers that we're lacking. And I wanted to inspire the younger generation to do that. There's actually a great example. We're in North America right now. Do you know how North America got its name? I don't know. So when Christopher Columbus came here, they thought this was the Indies. They said India. There was one person who disagreed. His name was Amerigo Vespucci. And he said that this isn't the Indies. This is just a part of the world that we don't know. And he was confident to say, I don't know. So many years later, when a cartographer was drawing North and South America, he said, we'll name it after Amerigo because he was not afraid to say, I don't know. I love that. You know, I actually live by the philosophy that I try to learn something new every day. So thank you for helping me learn something new today. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Fact, yeah. Let's go back to before Dr. Mike, when you were a medical student. Mm -hmm. That was a tough time for you. You lost your mom to yeah. leukemia. How did that affect your passion for the study of medicine and for connecting with people? I didn't expect having such a valuable lesson to be learned from a situation like that. Because obviously you're going through a traumatic time, grieving. My father, you know, when we came from Russia, he was a doctor in Russia and had to go to medical school here again for the second time in his 40s for a second language, very tough time. But they pushed through with the hopes that they would find a level of success for themselves, for me and my sister. And just as they were getting on their feet, unfortunately, we lost my mom. So I felt terrible for my entire family, my father mostly, given the fact that he lost his life partner. 
And it also taught me something valuable about chest compressions, as interesting as that sounds, because I had to be the one to ask the residents to stop chest compressions on my mom, where we realized it was futile to continue. And that is an important takeaway because as important it is to learn CPR for bystanders and everyone really in the world, and I preach that on my YouTube channel, there's also an important conversation to be had about when not to do chest compressions. Right. And that's a decision that needs to be made by the individual or the individual's families in a hospital setting, ideally, or with a medical provider. But that's a conversation we're not having enough these days. When you're in a hospital and that decision needs to be made, it's a blessing to know what the person would have wanted. In fact, we try and have that conversation when a patient's coming in with a non-serious illness, yes. non-critical illness, and sometimes it frightens patients because they, they ask, why are we having this conversation yes. now? And the explanation needs to be that if we're having this conversation when you're critical, it's too late. Yeah. So we want to have this when you're coming in for an average physical. We want to have this conversation when you're admitted with you know, an appendicitis or right. a pneumonia where it's not that serious. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a message that we really need to put forward. And you know, your father is a prominent physician and I know he's had a huge influence on you. Tell us about him. Does he watch your videos? Does he think about your accomplishments? Is, I'm sure he must be so proud of you. You know, it's funny, growing up, my father being a very tough Soviet father, um, he never really wanted to show that he was proud. He always wanted to continue pushing me to do better. Um, and it was only until I started getting through medical school, having this level of success, uh, on, on media and social media, that I started catching him being proud. And really that's been a big driver of my passion because he came here, he gave up his whole life to come here. He had to, you know, doing another eight years of education in your 40. I can't imagine what would have me leave this country to go to another country in a language I don't know and try to apply to medical school, live on welfare, hope that everything goes well, protect my family. I can't imagine the drive that he had to uh, have to make that a reality. So that his drive drives you, it exactly. seems like. Yeah. yeah, and I wanna make sure that he sees the fruits of his labor. I love that. Yeah. Well, I bet he will be so proud of the work that you're doing with the American Heart Association on hands-only CPR and the demonstration video that now plays on public kiosks across the country. What is it like seeing your fans on social media take the initiative to learn CPR? I mean, nothing can get me more excited than that. One of my slogans on my YouTube channel from day one has been chest compressions, chest compressions, yeah. chest compressions. And it goes even past uh, the people who watch my channel. It's also my patients. The other day, someone on my electronic health record sent me a message with a video attached that said, it was so strange. I was at the airport and I heard your voice and I thought you were in the airport. Yeah. But little did I know you were just talking about chest compression. So I took the time and learned how to perform hands-only CPR. So, I mean, nothing can be more rewarding than that. Yeah, and we know that CPR saves lives. And we know that fewer than 10% of people outside of a hospital survive a cardiac arrest. So thank you for helping us build a nation of, of lifesavers. I mean, thank you for all the support and everything that you've done in this space because Without CPR, that excess death that we were talking about before, that number, would be a lot higher. CPR yes. truly does save lives. Absolutely. So what's next for you? You recently launched a new podcast. What kinds of guests are you having? What topics will you feature on The Checkup? So this Checkup podcast was something I've always wanted to do, but it was another thing that to be added on that took a pretty hefty time commitment. But the goal was to get people of influence, politicians, movie stars, athletes, comedians, to come on and share their health vulnerabilities. Talk about what has gone well for them, where they struggle, not only to make the field of healthcare and the idea of getting good health relatable, but also to highlight a really unique problem that I've teased out in this unique space I find myself in. They think they could buy good health. And that's what I wanna teach the general public, that you can't buy good health. And when you go in to see your doctor, if you request antibiotics when you don't need them and you have a viral illness, when you request scans that are actually not beneficial for you and can actually cause harm, you're actually getting bad quality healthcare. So it was interesting to talk about this unique bimodal distribution of bad healthcare in our system. Dr. Thank Mike, you. thank you. It's such an honor to sit with you today and I look forward to continuing to do many great things Thank you, together. thank you, thank you for having me.
Dr. Mike is a force of nature. With his witty, caring, no-nonsense approach, his medical practice is improving the lives of millions of people by combating false and misleading claims and promoting healthy lifestyles. Have you ever fallen prey to misinformation online? Where do you go for reliable medical advice? I would love to hear from you, so please comment below, hit subscribe, and join me here next time for more inspiring conversations. From my heart to yours, thank you for watching.